Shalom. Call Halayimla, Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Raka, Kodash. Double honors to the apostles and elders of GMS, better known as Great Millstone, who rule well. Peace and salutations unto the hopeful elect, the tabernacle of David, beginning with the 144,000, and the rest of the men, women, and children out of the 12 tribes, whom Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai will have mercy upon. This is your brother Matizabath from the branch of the Great Millstone here in Melbourne, Australia. And I wanted to cover a particular topic um, that comes up pretty much every year. We have to go back to the basics uh, covering uh, the word strangers. All right. And that word seems to be a major stumbling block on a lot of these uh, so-called Christians, mainly our people that are still stuck on Christianity. And by our people, I'm speaking in. Uh, terms of you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans. Now, I've done a lesson dealing with vocab alone, which this is the same camp, all right, where himself and his goons came up to the brethren of GMS Cleveland, feed the flock, subscribe uh, to their channel so that you may be edified. Now, the brethren did a very, very great job, all right? They held it down. They stayed in the spirit, and a lot of edification was brought out. But the issue that you have here is, as the scripture says, a man that, not, that cannot take correction. All right. Well, let's see if we can grab that real quick because that's very important. All right. Because see, we're in these, you know, um, let's see here. I think it's in Proverbs. Uh, let's see. Correction is grievous. Right. Hopefully I spelled that right. I don't think I did. All right, Salakia. So this is uh, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 10. All right, let me just go into it. It says, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hated reproof shall die. All right, and that's the reason why, uh, beginning with the apostles, bishops, and elders on down, they always say that to hell with these Christians, man. You're going to die, all right, in your sins, Okay. Because you're not, you know, you're not trusting in the true names of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. You're calling upon, all right, a deity, all right, that has nothing to do with the nation of Israel. And that deity name is Jesus Christ, which if you did your due diligent research, that name actually goes back to Serapis Christos, all right? And the scriptures tells us to let it not be found any other names or any other gods uh, mentioned in our mouths, man. All right, but that's... You know, neither here or there, just making a quick point. Now, I'm going to start it here at the one hour and 30 minute mark. All right. Because what you're about to witness is, you know, this one Christian guy out of vocabs, a uh, little sect tries to go up against the true man of the Lord. All right. And he shows his folly and error in the scriptures. He errs not knowing the scriptures. All right. So what I want to do is play it from the one hour and 30 minute mark. All right. And then I'm going to stop commentary, get some scriptures to bring some edification. All right. Because a lot of you new Jakes that are coming into this truth, if you're out there. All right. At your camp. All right. Whether, you know, you're solo or you have another brother on the sideline with you helping to read, break down the scriptures. These are basic things that you must know so that if you get approached. All right. You know exactly how to deal with it in a manner and you know where to go where to bring the edification from through, you know, Rakak Kodash, the Holy Spirit, and break it down as best as you can, all right? Because the things that the apostles have taught us, you need to stay steadfast in to be able to break down these scriptures correctly and the things that you have been made real sure of, all right? And if you're not sure of it, the things that you are learning, let's go to Acts 17, you need to do what the Church of Berea did. This is Acts 17 and 11, it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Because when Paul and, and um, Silas went to the uh, went to Berea, all right, they were teaching. And so rather than those people that was in Berea coming up against, uh, you know, the uh, the gospel that was being taught. They just went and searched daily to see if those things that were being taught were uh, true or not. 
And that's what you, that's the sort of spirit you need to be in. All right. And so that's the you know, that's how we know these Christians. They don't understand the scriptures. They read it. All right. To 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 read. But they're not reading it to get an understanding. And what does the scripture say about that? Let's get Proverbs chapter four and verse seven. It says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding. All right. And for you to get the understanding, first, you have to be taught by the true man of the Lord. But even before that, you have to be called into this thing for many are called, but few are chosen. All right. So without further ado, let's play this. The statement you just said. I ain't the trying state, to trap nobody. I'm the state, we're listen, wrong. listen, you, listen. I just said you missed listen, one. I'm brother, fine with that. We keep going. If the nation of Israel have been in, the, in captivity under every nation, the scripture said that the nation of Israel would take them. Yes. Yeah, so they not. Wait, 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 First Corinthians, did we not just read that first Corinthians? What, what, what I'm first Corinthians on 29 and 15. Did we not just read that but can I about ask the you, strangers and sojourners? But can I ask you though? You, you can I, the scripture, right? Can I ask you about the text that he just read? Here it is. You are Israelite, nigga. You are Israelite. We telling you that you gonna rule over these niggas. Who they slave? And you going up against it? Nigga, how much is it? Listen, listen, period. Listen, brother. Listen. I'm trying to say, can I wait? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. May Yahweh Bashem Abishah destroy it, man. And that's why the scripture says, pray not for these people, man, in the book of Jeremiah. Because here it is, Jake, they don't understand that you are a nation, okay, that is beloved of the Heavenly Father through His only begotten Son, Yahweh Shai. And the scripture says that, that um, let's get that in Deuteronomy, basic precept, Deuteronomy 7 and 6. It says, for thou art an holy people unto Yahweh thy power. Yahweh thy power have chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Okay. And here it is. We're telling you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans that you are a chosen lineage, a, a royal bloodline. Okay. Rulers, gods of the planet earth. But yet you, you, you want to share your inheritance. Okay. With, with uh, heathens, other nations that were not written in the script. Okay. They, they, they wasn't written in the script to, to share that inheritance with you, man. Okay. You building the corner. That's a man foundation. So why is y'all trying to talk over us then? Why is he trying to talk over us then? That's your back. 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 Children of Jacob, his chosen. Keep going. His chosen. Keep going. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in okay. all the it's earth. Reason. Verse 8. Mm -hmm. He hath remembered his covenant forever. Amen. Go ahead. The Lord. word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Go ahead. Verse 9. Go ahead. Which covenant he made with Abraham. Abraham. What was the covenant to Abraham? Abraham. Uh, uh, go ahead. A nation. A nation. A nation. Go ahead. Now, let's clarify that because. He seems to be under this uh, uh, understanding that the covenant that was made to Abraham, all right, was going to falter uh, or Salaki, not falter, but it was going to uh, be in conjunction with the multitude of nations as a means to say that the other nations will take part in that covenant. And that's not the case. So let's go real quick to Genesis, the 17th chapter, where it all started. And I'm uh, starting the highlighted parts. Uh, we're going to start at verse five. It says, neither shall thy name anymore be called. And you know what? Salakia, forgive me. Let me start at verse three. And Abram fell on his face and the most high Yahweh would talk with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. All right. Now, somebody like that, that guy in the uh, video you know, Christian bug out will look at that 
at verse four and say, see, you're going to be a father of many nations, thinking that that's speaking of all the nations. And like the beloved elder Yashawamba always mentions when it comes to these Christians, when you deal with Christians, they always want to mention Abraham being their forefather, but never they want to mention Isaac and Jacob. Because when you mention Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in that order, then it forces you to understand that that covenant was not only first given to Abraham, but it was passed down to his seed, which was in Isaac. All right. As it tells us in Romans, the ninth chapter in thy seed, which is in Isaac, shall thy seed be called roughly paraphrasing. So when you have to deal with Isaac and Jacob, it forces you to understand that. Wait a minute. The heavenly father passed it down from Abraham to his seed, Isaac, and from Isaac to his seed, Jacob, and Jacob imparted that inheritance to the 12 tribes, his, uh, sorry, his uh, 12 sons, which we're going to get that in the Apocrypha. But keep going on here. It says, verse five, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee and I will make thee exceeding and fruitful and I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. All right. And that's important. So Abraham was not only going to be a father of many nations, which when you break the word Abraham down, that's simply what it means. Father of many nations. All right. Which to prove that let's go into it. All right. We have the name here. Abraham. All right. Father of a multitude or chief of a multitude. All right. So. Verse seven, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations. That's key because he said uh, a covenant with Abraham and the nations. No, it just clearly told you here in verse seven that the covenant was between Abraham and to his seed. OK, after thee and their generations, meaning their descendants. For an everlasting covenant to be a power unto thee and to thy seed after thee. It didn't say that he was going to be a God to all the other nations. Because even when you go back to Genesis, the uh, what's that? Genesis, the ninth chapter. And you deal with uh, Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth after the flood. Who was the uh, most high called the God of? This is um, Genesis 9 and 26. And he said, blessed be Yahweh, thy power of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. Why didn't it say, blessed be the Lord God of all the all the nations that believe in him or just, you know, to keep it short, simple and plain. Blessed be the Lord God of the nations, because the Lord was never dealing with everyone. This is why it's important to follow the, 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 the lineage of the sons of God, man. The Lord is only dealing with one nation of people. So in this, even in this context, it says, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Because when you follow Shem, Shem was the chosen line after the flood. Because it went from Noah finding grace and then out of his three sons, it, it continued on through the seed line of Shem. And then you continue on to Arphaxad, Methuselah, OK, Peleg. All right. And then you get to Abram, whose name was later changed to Abraham. So going back to the, the multitude of nations, let's go from there to Genesis, the 38 chapter real quick. And I'll slack in the 35th chapter. All right. At verse 10, this is when Jacob was sent to uh, Padanaram. Uh, and he came out of uh, Padanaram to find a wife. Um, Genesis 35 and 10, it says, And the Most High said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And the Most High said unto him, I am the Most High God Almighty. OK, which is Alashaja, which means terrible demon like power, be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee and kings shall come out of thy loins and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee. I will give it and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So the Lord told Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, which in the Hebrew is Yasharala, which when you break it down, Yah meaning he Shar. Uh, prince Allah power. He is the prince of the power. So he's telling Yasharala here that within you, a nation and a company of nations is going to come out of you. Okay. So what is that essentially saying? Well, basically 
in layman's terms, is saying that the, the, the descendants of Israel, the Israelites, they will become a multitude of nations within their selves. Now, can we prove that further? Absolutely. Let's go to Genesis, the 48th chapter. Genesis 48 and 4. All right, we'll start at verse 3. And Jacob said unto Joseph, the God Almighty appeared unto me in Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people. And I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. So now, when you jump down, because this goes right into Joseph's um, two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now watch what the blessing that was given to his sons. All right. We're going to drop down to verse 17. It says, and when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim. All right. Which today the Ephraimites represents your so-called uh, Puerto Ricans. All right. It displeased him and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Man uh, Manasseh's head. Now, the, uh, the tribe of Manasseh today is your so-called Cubans. All right. So it says, and Joseph said unto his father, not so my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. Now, listen closely to what uh, Israel is going to say to Joseph. It says he also shall become a people. Speaking of the tribe of Manasseh, because the Cubans today, they are a great uh, people, man. Right. And he sh and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. You see that? So when it says uh, Abraham, which means his name in the Hebrew, all right, a father of multitude. All right. That's what it was talking about. That blessing came on him through his seed line. OK, so. Ephraim itself, the so-called Puerto Ricans today. That's why when you go to the breakdown, all right, Genesis 49 and uh, let's see here, right around, uh, let's see, right around verse 26, I think it is. Uh, actually, no, Salakia. Uh, let's see here. Yep. Verse 22, it says, Joseph is a fruitful bow. Even a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. Right. Because when you look at uh, the Puerto Ricans today over there um, in Puerto Rico. All right. Their seed line runs through so much that 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 land can't really contain them. man. OK. That that land cannot uh, contain them. So Joseph, which is synonymous with uh, Ephraim, they're interchangeable. All right. Because when you read the scripture, sometimes it'll say Joseph, uh, which represents the northern kingdom or in conjunction, it'll say Ephraim sometimes. So Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. And speaking of the so-called Puerto Ricans today. OK, that's why they, they the, you know, Ephraim, they, they be getting down, man, with their women, man. They just be popping out babies. All right. They be getting it in. All right. Trying to keep it PG. But nevertheless, so. Let's uh, go to Acts. All right. And chapter three, because this is what it was said in the New Testament, uh, dealing with that uh, multitude of nations that was going to be blessed. All right. It wasn't talking about uh, the heathen nations. It says, verse 24, Acts three and 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye. Speaking to the Israelites, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which the Most High made with our fathers, possess a pronoun, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Now, let's look up this word kindreds in the Greek. All right. And um, so like, let me put it back on um, this right here. So actually, no, Salakia. So let's look up the word kindreds, which is very important. All right. You have the Greek word here, patria or patria. Strong's G 3965. Patria. Patria. All right. Now, in the outline biblical usage, it says lineage running back 
to some progenitor ancestry. Number two, a nation or tribe. OK, notice singular, not plural. It says uh, a, a group of families, all those who in a given people lay claim to a common origin. And here's the point. Verse. Uh, sorry. Uh, letter B. The Israelites, which distributed into 12 tribes, descended from the 12 sons of Jacob. These were divided into families which are divided into houses. That's how they became a multitude of nations. So in, in, in retrospect, it was speaking that the Israelites will be blessed amongst many of them because we became a multitude of large nations. That's why the scripture says we are as the sand of the sea. And as numerous as the stars. You see, now I said I was going to get the one in the Apocrypha, so let's get that real quick before we get back to the lesson um, going into the video. So let's get Ecclesiasticus chapter 44. And I'm going to start at verse 19. It says, Abraham was a great father of many people and glory was there none like unto him who kept the law of the Most High and was in covenant with him. And he established the covenant in his flesh. And when he was proved, he was found faithful. And therefore, he assured him by an oath that he would bless the nations in his seed. Now you understand what that means. The nations is referring to the descendants that came out of the 12 sons of, of Israel. Because we just read it in Acts 3 and um, going back here, Salakia. All right. Acts chapter 3 and verse 25. The kindreds of the earth be blessed. It was speaking of the children of Israel, right? So it says, verse 21, therefore he assured him by an oath that he will bless the nations and his seed and that he will multiply him as the dust of the earth and exalt his seed as the stars and cause them to inherit from sea to sea and from the river unto the uttermost part of the land. With Isaac did he establish likewise for Abraham, his father's sake, the blessing of all men. All men speaking of all men of Israel. OK. And the covenant and made it rest upon the head of Jacob. So it was passed down from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob. And he, meaning Jacob, acknowledged him in his blessing and gave him an heritage and divided his portions among the 12 tribes that he parked them. So you being a Christian, you will have to explain to us Israelites. OK, when did. The 12 tribes part the uh, the uh, inheritance, their blessing, their heritage that was given down from their forefathers and dispersed it among the other heathen nations. If you can give me three precepts to, to prove that the that the 12 tribes took the, the blessing that was passed down to them and they departed it to the other heathen nations as a means to say you can take part in the new covenant with us. I will step down and I will never teach again. I will step down and I will never teach again. Right. So let's go back to the video. In verse 9, they said, well, which covenant you made for Abraham, Abraham and his oath unto that. Isaac. I believe verse God 10, said and confirm the same unto Jacob for our law and to Israel for an Amen. everlasting Amen. covenant. Come on, man. Hey, it can't Come be everlasting because he got a new one. It can't be everlasting because he makes a new one. It just said he, he made a new one, so you know it's not everlasting. What do new mean? What do the word new mean? Hold on, brother. Shalakia, Shalakia. What do the word new mean? What do the word new mean? can't answer my question about Isaiah 14. I'm not answering you. I can answer what new and see, this is the, the little uh, games that Christian play. And this is why you don't have to deal with them, man. You see, because it's a simple question. The scripture says, let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. If you don't know. OK, matter of fact, the Apocrypha tells you that. Let's get that Ecclesiasticus. Ecclesiasticus chapter uh, five and. um. It says uh, here at verse 12, if thou has understanding, answer thy neighbor. OK, who's your neighbor, your fellow Israelite brethren? If not, lay thy hand upon thy mouth. So instead of you fucking sitting up there saying that, oh, well, if you're not going to answer my question, I'm not going to answer yours. No, he asked you a question, man. OK, be ready to give an answer. Just like you said, vocab, 
Let's get that in uh, 1 Peter 3 and 15, right? 1 Peter 3 and 15, but sanctify the Lord power in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So you should have gave an answer. You should have either said, you know, broke it down. What does the word new mean? The word new mean when it talks about new covenant, right? But if you don't know the answer, Ecclesiastes 5 and 12, if thou has understanding, answer thy neighbor. If not, lay thy hand upon thy mouth. You should have just shut up. You should have just kept your mouth shut. See, you Christians don't understand the scriptures, man. You really don't. So let's deal with that. Let's go to Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, and dealing with the new covenant and what does it mean by the word new? Right? So this is, um, let's start here. Uh, Jeremiah 31. Now notice it says a new covenant, right? So I'm going to start, I'm going to just get to the point. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to start at verse 30. It says, um, but everyone shall, you know, we'll start at verse 29. It says, in those days, they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. And every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. All right. Now, like the, the brother asked you, what does the word new mean? OK, because, see, when you read the scriptures verbatim, remember, as it says in the Apocrypha, the prologue in the book of Ecclesiasticus, the same things uttered in Hebrew, but translated into another tongue, meaning another language, have not the same uh, force in them, meaning the same meaning. You can have something that's called lost in translation, man. OK, when, when something that has been translated several times, it can lose its actual true origin meaning behind certain words. So when we go into this word new. In the Hebrew, all right. Strong's H twenty three nineteen. Chadash. Chadash. Right. Chadash, which simply means a new thing, but something that's fresh, something that's afresh or refreshed. That's really what it means. It doesn't mean that it's absolutely new. It just means that it's been, in a sense, fresh, updated. Right. Now, when you go to the Greek, let's go to Hebrews 8. All right. And um, let's see here. We'll go to Hebrews 8. I'm going to start at 7. It says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, let's look up the word new here in the Greek. All right. Now you have the Greek word. Kainos. Okay. Strong's G twenty five thirty seven. Kainos. Kainos. All right. Now it says here in the outline biblical usage, it says new as respects form recently made fresh, recent, unused, unworn as respects substance of a new kind, unprecedented, novel, uncommon, unheard of. OK. Now, it says here, Strong's definition, new, especially in freshness, while gives you Strong's G3501 is properly so with respect to age, new. So all it means is it's just being refreshed in a sense. It doesn't mean that it's absolutely new, like I'm just going to do it. Wait, no. Because when you understand the covenant, all right. We were given a law of statutes commandments, but because we couldn't keep it, because we were subject to uh uh, vanity pursuant to uh, Romans the eighth chapter, right? The the heavenly father, he had to update it. He had to make it uh, better. So it's been refreshed, which this time around, the laws are going to be put in our inward part, which proves and, and also cuts you Christians that the laws, uh, the law, statutes and commandments were never actually done away with. Because if that be the case, why is it that the Israelites, when the kingdom of heaven is established on the planet Earth, the law, statutes and commandments is going to be put in their inward parts so that they never go off again. All right. So that's strike two. Let's continue. 
for me. Okay, I said, I'm asking again. Isaiah 14 and 1 is talking about the Israelites. I just want clarity. You made a good point. Let's talk about the Israelites. You made a good point. You said it can't be everlasting because he's going to make a new one. What do the word new mean? Can we, can we, what do the word new mean? It means to be refreshed. It means refresh. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You know why it doesn't? Because Hebrew says it's made obsolete. It was made obsolete. It means to be restored. It's obsolete. Can we talk about the Israelites? And that, and that's another thing, right? And they, that what's that? Uh, yeah, Hebrews eight, right? Which let's read it. So, verse ten: For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord: I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. That's how we know we're not in a new covenant right now, because if we were, we wouldn't have to teach our fellow Israelite brethren to know the Lord. We wouldn't have to teach them to stop, uh, you know, sin and stop going off, stop committing adultery. All right. Stop uh, blaspheming. Stop um, committing uh, uh, or bearing false witness, things of that sort. Right. It says, verse 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. But here's the point. This is what he's trying to say. Verse 13, and that he said they new covenant. He had made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. It didn't say that it was obsolete right now. No, it's ready to be done away with when the new covenant is fully set in when Yahweh Shai comes back, because right now. We're in between the covenants. We're under grace. All right. That's something that they don't understand. So they like to use Hebrews 8 and 13 as a means to say that it's been obsolete. It's been done away with. No, it's not. It's ready to vanish away, but it will only be done away completely once Yahweh Shai comes back and fully establishes the uh, updated, the fresh covenant. OK, which is in this sense, the new covenant. All right. So that's another strike. Will I not break? It says my covenant will I not break. Go to the thing that is going on my list. So why does he make it? He can't alter the covenant that he made. He can't. I got the new covenant right here. The covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's it. Right, because the scriptures tells you that the uh his let me get that in Galatians disannul. Right? Let's get Galatians and um I think that's let's see here. Oh, let me just type it in. I might have spelt it wrong. Right, Galatians three. Now, watch this. I'm going to start at verse 16. Oh, you know what? I'm going to start at verse 15. All right. The intent of the law. It says, brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one into thy seed, which is Hamashiach. Meaning what? When the covenant was originally first given to Abraham, it was stated, as we read in Genesis, the 17th chapter, that it was going to be passed down to his seed, which was in Isaac, which let's go to that. Romans nine. OK. Now, uh, Romans nine and six, not as though the word of the most high have taken on effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, right? Because Abraham had eight sons, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. All right. That's this is why it's important. You have to follow the seed line. OK, now let's go back to Galatians three and 16. Let's read it again. Now to Abraham and the seed were the promises made. He said, if not into seeds, because after Isaac. Or before Isaac, he had who? Ishmael, which Ishmael got blessings, but he wasn't under the promise. Then after Isaac came, he had uh, eight. No, sorry. He had six sons with Keturah. Right. 
and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Hamashiach. Now, before I read verse 17, which is the point, what happened to Keturah's six sons? Let's see if they were counted um, in that promise. Genesis 25. Then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran and uh, Jokshan and Medan and Median and Ishbak and Shua. And Joshkin begot Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ash uh, Asherim and Latushim and Luim. And the sons of Median, Ephah and Ephah and Hanak and Abadah and Eldah. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. But unto the sons of the concubines right showing you that abraham had <laughs> many women it said unto the sons of the concubines which abraham had abraham gave gifts and sent them away from isaac his son why didn't abraham um included his sons that he had with these other women uh under the blessing that he gave to isaac because that's not how the lord wanted it man Showing you that the Lord is not dealing with the other nations like that, man. He's only dealing with a specific uh, lineage, okay? A, a specific chosen people, okay? Verse 6 again, it says, But unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So those six sons were not included. Because, yes, the, the uh, Numbers 118 says the, the, the pedigree is determined by the house of the father, right? So you would think that, well, that's my father, too. I'm going to get a part of that inheritance. Nope, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. All right, so now go back to Galatians 3 and 17. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before the Most High in Hamashiach, the law, which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non effect because the Lord, what, what he promised to Abraham back then, that's not going to be, he's not going to um, renege and go back on his promise, man. Okay. It says verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but the most high gave it to Abraham by promise. That's the point. Okay, and the scripture says the Lord is a man that he should not lie. All right, so you got to understand that these Christians, they don't understand the volume of the book, man. Let's get it, though. Hey, and he don't change. Hey, he 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 so, so back to Isaiah 14. Go what you got. Oh, back to this is Jeremiah 31 and 31. It says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. You see how this is completely out of order on this dude's part, not on the brethren. All right. But on this dude's part. All right. Because the, the Bible tells you you're not to uh, interrupt men in the midst of their talk. Right. Let's lock you. Um, let's see. Interrupt. I might have spelled it wrong. Mist of talk. Ecclesiastes 11 and 8. It says, um, answer not before thou hast heard the cause, neither interrupt men in the midst of their talk. All right. Because the scriptures tells you, let's get first Corinthians, the uh, 14th chapter. All right. Let everything be done decently and in order. Okay. First Corinthians 14 and 40 says, let all things be done decently and in order. So when a brother is bringing out the word, you're supposed to uh, hold your peace. You're not supposed to talk. Matter of fact, let's get Ecclesiastes 5 and 1. It says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of the Most High and be more ready to hear than to give sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they have the uh, salaki that they do evil. It says, be not rash with thy mouth and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before the most high. Why? Because you up, you're here. All right. Salakia, you're in front of the men of the Lord. And the scripture says where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. This is the house of the Lord right here, man. 
So be not hasty to utter anything out of your mouth. You should be more ready to hear than to make yourself look like an idiot, man. Right now, going back here, verse two, again, it says, be not rash with thy mouth and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before the most high for the most high is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few because the Lord has set up. Let's get Isaiah 30 and 20. It says, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. So he's set up teachers to teach you. OK, it says in thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. Right now, what did he say also in Jeremiah? All right. Jeremiah three and um. 15, it says, I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Let's look at that word pastors real quick. All right. Hebrew word, ra'ah, ra'ah. It says, uh, basically, let's jump down to a uh, strong definition. <clears throat> it says, um, to tend a flock, pasture it, and transitively to uh, uh, graze. Literally or figuratively, generally to rule by extension to associate with as a friend, break companion, keep company with, uh, devour, eat up, evil, entreat, feed, use as a friend, make friendship with, herdman, keep, sheep, pastor, sharing house, shepherd, wander, waste. All right. That's basically what it is, man. And to be a, um, to tend to the flock. All right. You guide over it, man. You teach it. You have to direct it. Okay. And he's not understanding that the men, of the, uh, these are the men of the Lord whom Yahweh Bashem al set up to rule over the flock, man. Okay, let's continue. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Which my covenant they break, although I wasn't hoping to took them. See, I'm gonna say this man right now. And then on top of that, he's he's reading. You know, with his hat on, man. You know, that does not the scripture says, you know, when you praying or prophesying to not have your head covered, man. So he's dishonoring his head, man. And who is his head? Y'all about Shemel Y'all should be really. Y'all should be really scared right now, man. Y'all should be. Hey, this is the house of the Most High, man. So now, so why everybody over here laughing and joking? You're the only one. Okay. So listen, hey, the Lord gonna destroy. The Lord gonna destroy y'all, man. But if I'm Israel, don't matter because I'll just come back anyway. In the kingdom, oh, as a nutsack with us. And that, and that's a that's the wrong spirit to be in. So if I down this, I'm just gonna come back in the kingdom anyway, man. Like the the niggas like this, bro. Yeah. You gonna get destroyed, man. You're going to get destroyed. And that's why the scripture says you're going to have your head down in the kingdom. You're going you're gonna, to uh, be shameful, man, because you're going to look back. You're going to be in your right state of mind, but you're going to look back and say, damn, I should have listened. You're going to have your head down in the kingdom, man. You know? Are you on the head on while you preach the word? Hey, y'all got cousin. It says, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Can you acknowledge that Isaiah 14, the strangers here, can't be Israel? They are. It can't be Israel. No, not based on what. Can you acknowledge that Isaiah 14 and verse 1, when it talks about the word strangers, cannot be Israel, right? That's what it is. But can I explain to you why they not? Can I explain to you why I don't believe they are? Why don't believe what you're talking about? But if we in the you don't believe it. But if we in the you don't believe it. Look, if you don't want to give me the same thing, give me Deuteronomy 23 and 7. Why can't you just do it? Because I already know what it means. So let's address that. All right, then we'll close out. So 
Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 1. For the Lord Yahweh will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Now, according to his understanding, the word strangers there simply cannot be talking about what we believe through the spirit that is speaking of Israelite foreigners. All right. And how do we know that? Because when you understand the value of the book in terms of the heavenly father stated that the other nations are likened unto spittle unto him. All right. And he count them as vanity. All right. Meaning that they're meaningless. Right. And the scriptures tells you that Israel beginning with the elect shall possess the other uh, heathen nations in the kingdom, which is going to tell you that in the very next verse. So when you understand that from that perspective, you have to ask yourself why in one sense would it say that they want to join and cleave to the house of Israel. But then at the same time, Israel is going to possess them and put them in bondage by uh, ruling over them and subjecting them to be servants and handmaids. That does not make sense. So you will have to go back to the drawing board. And this is why we have to look up these words and get the understanding and go through the precepts for the scripture says through thy precepts. I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Right. That's the book of Psalms, chapter one, uh, Salakia, chapter 119 and verse 104. Right. So let's look up this word strangers. In the Hebrew. And you have the Hebrew word gar. All right. Now it says in the outline biblical usage, a sojourner, a temporary inhabitant, a newcomer lacking inherited rights of foreigners in Israel, though conceded rights. All right. Conceded rights. We're going to come back to that. But the Strong's definition says properly a guest by implication, a foreigner, alien, sojourner or stranger. Now, most or, or if not all Christians in general, you guys never we're going into the Strong's Concordance until you came on, uh, you know, through the videos of the apostles and elders of Great Millstone, man, because it was the beloved elder apostle to heart. I got everybody uh, onto the blue letter, man. OK. And when you started watching our videos, then y'all started to go into the Greek and the Hebrew. But before that, you wasn't going into the Greek and the Hebrew. All right. I have to put that out there now. Going back where it says uh, foreigners in Israel, though, conceded rights. What does that actually mean? When you look it up, <clears throat> conceded, conceding, it says to grant as a right or privilege. OK, and then two, it says to admit the truth or existence of something. All right. But we're focusing on number one. The highlighted part says to grant as a right or privilege. Now, we know that the Lord said when you go to Deuteronomy 23. And two, it says a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his 10th generation, shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their 10th generation, shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. When did that change? Because the question I will put back on you is, do, Am do Ammon and Moab fit into the strangers category in Isaiah, the 14th chapter? When it just told you here in Deuteronomy that they, they cannot come into the congregation even until the 10th generation forever. So when you guys keep throwing out, see, we got to get context. You got to understand the context. You motherfuckers don't even know what context is. And yes, I curse and cursing is not a sin. You see what I mean? You, you have no idea what the scriptures is talking about, man. All right. <laughs> let me let me get that back myself up with that. Second Corinthians 11 and six. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But we have been truly made manifest among you in all things, man. So don't get offended. All right. In the tone of my voice and, and, and me cu and cussing from time to time, man. OK, you should you should take fear and, and what these uh, what these words of Yahweh Shemel is saying, man. And stop bucking up against the true man of the Lord. So Dylan, going back to the word strangers. All right. Let's get some context. The proper context with this. Now, we looked up the word strangers gar. Now, 
when you go back to it, just to show you something real quick. <clears throat> All right. Now, when you go into the Jacinian lexicon right here, it says a sojourner, stranger, foreigner, a person living out of his own country. Now, look at the precepts it gives you. Genesis 15 and 13. The one we're going to focus on is Exodus 2 and 22. All right. Etc. It says often joined with the synonym. All right. Um, what is that? I uh, can't really see that. But it says a stranger. All right. And it says compare Mike on the laws of Moses. Now, let's go to Exodus 2 and 22, because when you go there. It deals with Moses' son, Gershom. Exodus 2 and 22, it says, And she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Now, let's go to the Hebrew word for go, uh, Gershom. Strong's H, 1647. Gershom. Gershom. Now, it says here, foreigner, right? That's literally what it means, foreigner. Okay? Now, you jump down. Hebrew Chaldee lexicon. It says, of the son of Moses in Sephora. It says, in the former place, the etymology of this name is alluded to in such a manner that it appears that the writer took it for Shum. All right? Which should be uh, Gershom. A stranger there. This is, of course, the true etymology. Moses wrote by inspiration and he knew very well why he gave this name to his own son. So in that in retrospect, they're saying that the name Gershom really means to be a foreigner, stranger in the land, which goes back to the word Gar. OK, that's literally uh, what it means. So let's see here. All right, you have, uh, let's play this. Strong's H, 1648. Gershon. Gershon. Which means to uh, be exiled, right? Let's go to the root. Garash. All right. To drive out, expel, cast away, drive away, divorce. But when you go back, all right, to a Gershon foreigner, it gives you the word there. Let's see if I can zoom in. I don't know if it'll let me. All right. Gar and then Shum. All right. And this is why it's important to look these words up, man. OK, so now let's go from there, because here's the thing. Let's go to Exodus 12 and we bring this out all the time. All right, because. The word stranger has different meanings, different definitions, different words, I should say. Uh, Exodus 12 and 43. And the Lord Yahweh said unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. Now, let's see if this is the same word that we read in Exodus or uh, Salakia, Isaiah 14 and 1. Right. Now, you have here a different word. You have here the Hebrew word in the car, which means foreign, alien, foreignness, that which is foreign. Foreigners, foreign gods, alien, foreigner, foreigner, foreign vanities. Now, the strong definition says foreign or concretely a foreigner or abstractly heathendom. All right. Alien stranger. So this Hebrew word. All right. In this context, what we read in Exodus 12 and 43 is speaking of actual heathens. All right. But we're going to show you another scripture where that same Hebrew word in the car is actually speaking of Israelites. And this is why you have to understand the context. Now, in this context, in Exodus 12 and 43, that word Hebrew word Nakar is referencing to heathens that cannot take part of the Passover. Okay. It says, There shall no stranger eat thereof. It says, But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. This is going into Israelite. Because remember, we read in Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter, that not even your Ammonite or Moabite can come into the congregation. Right. Continue reading on. It says a foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. 
It says, in one house shall he shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. OK, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Now, here's the point. Verse 48. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Now, let's see if this word stranger is the same Hebrew word that we read in verse 43. Now you have here the word gar, the same word in Isaiah, the 14 chapter. OK, this is speaking of Israelites, foreigners who were not born in the Holy Land. You were not to treat them as a stranger because now you got to go back to the law. Let's go to Le Leviticus, the 25th chapter. All right. It says the law of redemption, Leviticus 25 and 23. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. Now, you drop down of poor and countrymen, verse 35. And if thy brother, a fellow Israelite brother, be waxing poor and fallen and decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Because you had Israelites that were considered strangers, they were sojourners. Remember that, you know, the people, you see these Christians, they don't read to comprehend what the scriptures are saying. You had Israelites that were not born in the Holy Land, therefore they became strangers. They were foreigners. Okay, but not only that, now we, we remember because when we started worshiping other gods and we started going off. The Lord said this, all right, Jeremiah 2 and uh, 21. It says, yet I have planted thee a noble vine, holy, a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? We became strange unto the Lord. Because we started a whoring after other gods, man. This is why when you jump to the New Testament, what did Peter say? First Peter 1. And one, it says, Peter, now remember, Peter was the apostle for the circumcision, the Jews. Now watch this. Peter and an apostle of Yahweh Mashiach to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Right? Now we're going to pull out these words, strangers and scattered. All right. So let's look up the word strangers in the Greek. Strong's G, 3927. Parepidemos. Parepidemos. Right. It says, one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside there by the side of the natives, a stranger, so joining in a strange place, a foreigner, and the NT metaphor in reference to heaven as the native country, one who should join us on earth. Right. Because we're known as pilgrims on the earth. Okay. So it says here, Strong's definition. Uh, an alien alongside, i.e. a resident foreigner, a pilgrim, a stranger. Now we need to pick out another word to find out who these strangers really were. Let's look at the word scattered next to it. Strong's G1290. Diaspora. Diaspora. All right. Now outline biblical usage. It says a scattering dispersion of Israelites dispersed among foreign nations. It says of the Christians scattered abroad among the Gentiles, which the Christians ultimately is speaking of Israelites. But here's the point. Strong's definition. It says dispersion, i.e. especially and concretely the converted Israelite. It didn't say the converted heathen, the converted Edomite, the converted Moabite, the converted Ammonite, the converted Hamite, the converted Jebusite. No, it said the converted Israelite resident and Gentile countries which are scattered abroad because when you go to james the first chapter what did james say james a servant of the most high and of the lord yahweh shah hamashiach to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad these were the people that were called strangers because outside of the circumcision that were in the holy land you had israelites that were not in the holy land they were considered strangers man 
You see? You had to, and those Israelite foreigners that were not keeping the customs, they weren't circumcised, they were Hellenized, going back to the Greek captivity, they were considered heathens, Gentiles, strangers. Okay? They were not known to the commonwealth. It's not that hard to put together. So, you know, we don't need that no more. So, yeah, let's finish this out. Nah, I listen to you for sure. Yeah, like, but you ain't trying to I will. You ain't trying to, y'all trying to overtake us. That, that's because you started. Why do y'all come up here so deep? Because y'all wanted to try to overtake our show. No, but this is the show of your how about shit, man. Why are you prophesying with a hat on? 23. Y'all got flaws. That's right. And they, they only came up there uh, with confusion, man. And see, this is why we don't debate. All right? Because debate leads to strife, contention. All right? Um... And you're not being sincere, man. All right. You're not being sincere. So let me see. There's another scripture. Um, I think it's 2 Timothy 4. Or actually, let's get um, 1 Timothy 4. Um, actually, no. I think I had it. I think it's 2 Timothy 2. Yep. 2 Timothy 2, 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. All right. Let's get that in a different translation. NLT, it says, again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only starts fights. And that's all it's going to do, man. That's why we don't uh, we don't debate. All right, because the scripture says, going back to first Corinthians, the 14th chapter. If a man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. First Corinthians 14 and 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. And the reason why you Christians don't know anything is because let's get the Apocrypha, which the Apocrypha is canon, contrary to popular belief. All right. This is Sirach chapter 39, verse 24. As his ways are plain unto the holy, so are they stumbling blocks unto the wicked. Okay, and let's also get the one in Daniel real quick. Daniel 12. And um, let's see here. Um, Daniel 12 and verse. Is it verse four? Um, actually, no, Salakia. Yep. Daniel 12 and 10, it says, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. All right. Because remember, two thirds of our people, they're wicked, man. They're not going to understand these scriptures. OK, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's my take on um, what transpired here. And like I said, the brethren, they did a great job. You know, when you watch the whole video. There was a lot of going back and forth, but at the end of the day, you know, these brothers, you know, they stood steadfast in the faith. All right. They gave out great uh, knowledge and edification on the scriptures. All right. But just beware a lot of you newcomers, uh, you newer brothers in the faith. All right. On how to deal with situations like this, man. All right. So stay prayed up. All right. Continue to do uh, works. Meet unto repentance. Have faith in Yahweh Bashim El Shai. And, um, I'm going to end it off there, and I want to give all praise, glory, and honor be to Yahweh, Ba'ashim, Yahweh Shai, Ba'ashim, Rakaha, Kodash. Double honors to beloved apostles and elders of Great Millstone, better known as GMS, who rule well. Peace and salutations unto the hopeful elect, the tabernacle of David. All right, I'm your brother, Matazaba, once again, and I pray that this has been another edifying lesson through the spirit and the power of Yahweh, Ba'ashim, Yahweh Shai. So with that, Shalom.